my screen. Oh, wait, I shared the wrong screen. I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint first. All right, so I put a, uh, what I did is I went through our, our textbook and grabbed some pictures so we would have something to look at. Um, as I teach you the, 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 the structure, some of the structures and the physiology concerning the heart. So if at any time I'm going too fast or you have a question, just uh, unmute and then holler at me, all right? All right, so first of all, everybody knows that your heart is located in your thoracic cavity, right in the middle between your lungs. We all know that. Just like this picture shows, we know our heart is in here between the lungs and your thoracic cavity. But uh, we also need to know that the, the anatomical name for this space where the heart is anchored is called the mediastinum. It's really why I have this here, just so you basically learn this term. So the mediastinum is a central location in the thoracic cavity. It's just posterior to the sternum. The sternum, sternum has been removed, but anterior to your vertebral column. So obviously your vertebral column is lying behind the heart back there. So in that space, it's called the mediastinum. The heart itself is anchored in place by a double layered membrane inside the mediastinum and it's called the pericardium. So I wanna go through the layers of the heart wall and show you the pericardium in this little diagram right here. So I'm gonna start from the innermost side of the heart. So here's the heart. This is what we call a frontal section, by the way. If you cut the heart in a frontal plane, that's what this is. You, you can see the left side of the heart is gonna be over here as I show you pictures of it in a minute and then the right side of the heart. But if, you, if we enlarge the little portion of the heart wall itself, it looks like this. So starting on the most internal or the deepest layer of the heart wall, you have what's called the endocardium. So that's what that is right there. The endocardium lines the inside of the chambers of the heart. The thickest part, of the heart wall is actually where the cardiac muscle is located. So all of this in the middle is where the cardiac muscle is located. That's going to contract and relax ultimately to move blood through the heart and into the cardiovascular system. And that layer of the heart is called the myocardium. Now, just external to the myocardium or the most superficial layer of the heart, the artist of this picture colored it in blue. It's not really blue in there, but this first little blue area that you see is called the epicardium. If you remember from AMP1, we had the epidermis, right? So the epidermis was on top of the dermis. So the epicardium is on top of the heart. But notice it has this other weird name, the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. So look at these two blue layers right here that's separated by this little space. These two blue layers that the artist drew in of this picture is called the pericardium. It's a double layered membrane. We have a couple of places in our body where organs are surrounded by a double layered membrane. It technically is called a serous membrane. And these serous membranes are made of a simple squamous epithelium. So really this blue layer and this outer one is nothing more than a sheet of simple squamous epithelial tissue that you learned in AMP1. Now these two simple squamous cell layers secrete a lubricating fluid. Generically it's called a serous fluid, but since it's pertaining to the pericardium, the fluid that it produces is technically called pericardial fluid. So that pericardial fluid is secreted into this little bitty space. It's not a huge space. It's a little potential cavity in there. It's called the pericardial. It's called the pericardial cavity. So that pericardial fluid that's secreted by these two layers basically lubricates the heart as it beats inside of the sac. So it 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 decreases friction so it doesn't get hot and cause inflammation. So since there are two layers to this membrane, 
the layer of the pericardial membrane that is closer to an organ, in this case, the heart, obviously, the layer of a double layered membrane that is closer to the organ is always called visceral. The layer of a double layered membrane that is always farther away from the organ, albeit it's right there, but it's still farther away from than that one. The one that's farther away from the organ is called uh, the parietal layer. So visceral layer is on the organ and the parietal layer of a double layered membrane is a little bit off of the organ. So we have a double layered membrane around the heart. We're gonna see it in when we do the lungs and the respiratory system. And we're gonna see it when we do the digestive system around your digestive organs in the abdominal cavity. So these are serous membranes. So the outermost layer of the heart wall is called the epicardium, but also it is the visceral layer of the serous pericardium, all right? And then pericardial fluid would be in this little pericardial cavity. The next layer is the parietal serous pericardium, and that's what this word is, and it secretes pericardial fluid into that cavity. So the two blue layers are part of the pericardium. It's just that that part of the pericardium is called the serous pericardium because it produces serous fluid. Now the outermost layer of the pericardium, the sac itself that surrounds the heart, does not secrete a fluid. It's non-elastic. It's very tough, made of collagen fibers. It's this layer right here. The outermost layer is called the fibrous pericardium. This is what anchors the heart in place in the mediastinum. It anchors it in place and it also prevents the heart from overstretching, right? So I need you to know the layers of the heart wall. If you have trouble with that later, just let me know. All right, so let's go over uh, some of the chambers and structures of the heart itself. If you haven't looked at it yet, I know you, you're, you're not going to remember everything I say. That's why it's, it's important that you go look at these, these images and learn how to identify them over and over and over. All right. So let me just set you up as to what we're looking at here. On, obviously, on the left-hand side, this is a graphic of a heart, human heart. This is a real human heart over here that's been dissected open with a frontal section. All right. Same thing here. So if we're looking at the heart as if we're looking at a patient, you're looking basically at their chest, what is on your right side is actually the left side of their heart. And what's on your left side is the right side of the heart. So in other words, if a patient was lying on a table and you're standing over them and you're looking down at them and you were looking at the heart, this side over here would be on our right side. Well, that's the left side of the heart over here. And on our left side is the right side of the heart. Whenever you're looking at the anterior view, right and left is reversed. Just always remember that, all right? Now, if you're looking at the posterior view, that's different, all right? Because if you're looking at, like you're looking at somebody's back, your right arm is on the same side as their right arm and vice versa with the left, okay? So some basic uh, identifying characters here with the heart. First of all, up here at what you think is the top of the heart, this is called the base. The base of the heart is where all of the great vessels enter and leave the heart. So the largest artery in the body receives blood and, and blood goes out from the heart here. Um, same thing over here. This is the artery, even though it's blue. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. This is going to be more so for next week's talk, but this is an artery. This is the superior vena cava. You might have heard of that. Inferior vena cava. So all of those pulmonary veins, pulmonary arteries, all these vessels enter and leave up from the base. The pointy part of the heart is called the apex of the heart. Now, we have four chambers in our heart. 
there are two upper atrial chambers up here, the left atrium, and over here, the right atrium. And there are two lower ventricles, the left ventricle down here and the right ventricle right here. There are four valves in the heart, four. And all four valves in the heart operate to ensure that blood only ever moves in one direction through the heart. And we're about to cover the blood flow through the heart. So for instance, you see right here, this little flap with these little strings on it, same thing over here. These little flaps right here represent two of the four valves. So the two valves that actually have these little cords on them separate an atrium from a lower ventricle. So notice here's an atrium, here's a ventricle. Here's an atrium and here's a ventricle. So the valves that separate an atria from a ventricle are called atrioventricular valves. Atrioventricular valves, it's also abbreviated AV valve. That's just a generic name for it. So there's two AV valves in the heart. The one on the right side of the heart separates the right atrium from the right ventricle. That's called the tricuspid, the tricuspid valve. The one on the left side of the heart separates the left atrium from the left ventricle. It's called the bicuspid or the mitral valve. So that's another name and it's still commonly used, the mitral valve. So only the AV valves have these little cords on them. Those cords, by the way, are called chordae tendini, right here. And the chordae tendini anchor the tip of the valve or the flaps of the valve, and the flaps are called a cusp, by the way. The chordae tendini anchor the cusp of a valve to a little muscle that protrudes from the musculature of the ventricle. And that little muscle down there inside the ventricle where the cords insert are called papillary muscles. So you got some on the right side of the heart, you got some on the left side of the heart. And by the way, the tricuspid valve is called tricuspid because that valve has three cusps. Tri means three. The bicuspid on the other hand only has two cusps. So Bi means two, like bicycle has two wheels. So those are the two AV valves. Now we also have two semilunar valves in the heart. The semilunar valves are structurally different from the AV valves. There's no cords. There's no cord A tendony. And so this uh, semilunar valve right here, this is another valve is called the pulmonary valve or the pulmonary semilunar valve. And the pulmonary valve has the job of separating the right ventricle from the pulmonary trunk right here. So this, this broad artery right here is called the pulmonary trunk until it starts to branch off, All right? So that's called the pulmonary trunk and it's separated from the right ventricle by the pulmonary valve. Now in this picture, you can barely see it, but those little bitty flaps the artist drew in right there is the aortic semilunar valve, or sometimes just called the aortic valve. And it has a job of separating the left ventricle from, as it goes behind the pulmonary trunk right here, separates the aorta from the left ventricle. So these four valves, the, the AV valves and the semilunar valves, separate one area of the heart from another one or one area of the heart from its artery. And these valves open and close at different times during the cardiac cycle in order to allow blood to move in one direction through the heart. That's why we have the valves. We do not want blood regurgitating 
let's say from a ventricle back up into an atrium where it came from. If blood is supposed to go from an atrium to a ventricle, as we're gonna learn in a second, if the ventricle goes to contract and this valve is faulty, blood can, can be squirted right back up where it came from. And it then means that that volume of blood that went back where it came from is not going into the cardiovascular system where it's supposed to go. So that's why we have to have those valves in working order. We don't want the blood regurgitating back where it came from, all right? All right, so the next thing I want you to notice off of this picture is the left side of the heart in the picture is colored red. The right side of the heart is colored blue. So in pictures in your book, whenever you see in the cardiovascular system, whenever you see the heart, this side that's blue and the side that's red, it means that the, the side that's blue is only receiving and then pumping out deoxygenated blood. The side that's red in the heart is receiving and then pumping out oxygenated blood. So that's why it's blue and red. Now, I will say this about the chambers and then we'll go through the blood flow through the heart. The two upper atrial chambers, the right atrium and the left atrium are what we call receiving chambers because the atria receive blood from somewhere in the body. So let's look at the right atrium. The right atrium is colored blue, by the way, as you can see, which means it only receives deoxygenated blood from somewhere in the body. That means the blood that it is receiving has already gone through the tissues in the body. The tissues already took out the oxygen they need. And now the blood is being returned back to the heart at the right atrium. So ultimately, the heart can send that deoxygenated blood to the lungs to get reoxygenated. We're going to go over that, that flow in a second. So the two upper atrial chambers are what we call receiving chambers. Notice the left atrium is red. That's because it receives blood that is oxygenated from ultimately from the lungs. So the lungs are gonna return blood back to the left atrium. The two lower ventricles are called the pumping chambers because the ventricles have the job of ejecting blood into an artery that then sends the blood to a particular location in the body. So for instance, the right ventricle, still colored blue, has the job of receiving the deoxygenated blood from the right atrium, because remember, it's only receiving deoxygenated blood. So that deoxygenated blood goes from the right atrium into the right ventricle. The right ventricle has the job of pumping that deoxygenated blood into the pulmonary trunk that then goes to the lungs and we know the lungs lie just on the side of the heart and we breathe in and out. We reoxygenate the blood, take the CO2 out, put the oxygen in and that freshly oxygenated blood leaves the lungs and returns to the left atrium. So the left atrium is receiving oxygenated blood from the lungs. That oxygenated blood goes to the left ventricle the left ventricle has the job of pumping oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. And so from the left ventricle, that freshly oxygenated blood is gonna be ejected up into the aorta, the largest artery in the body. And from the aorta, there's three parts to the aorta. It's called ascending, the arch of the aorta, and notice how it starts to go down behind the heart. So as it, arches over and goes posterior to the heart, it goes down. That's called the descending aorta. So we have the ascending, it goes up a little bit, it arches over, it's called the aortic arch, and then we have descending. All of the branches that come off of the aorta, 
are the arteries that are supplying oxygenated blood to all the tissues in the body. So it's next week's lab's responsibility to cover the arteries and then all the veins. So let me, let me define for you an artery and a vein. Arteries are the vessels in the body that transport blood away from the heart. So any blood vessel that is transporting blood away from the heart is called an artery. Any blood vessel that is transporting blood back to the heart is called a vein. So all veins return blood back to the heart somewhere. So normally out in the body, if you happen to look at pictures already, or you will, you know, before next week's lab of arteries and veins, say in the arm, all of the red vessels in your arm are arteries. All of the blue vessels in your arm are veins. All of the red vessels in your leg are arteries and all of the blue vessels in your leg are veins. So basically, I'm about to teach you the two principal blood circuits in our body, the systemic circuit and the pulmonary circuit. And I don't want you all getting confused on the coloration because look at this picture of the heart. This vessel right here is a vein. This is the superior vena cava, which means one of two of the largest veins in the body, inferior vena cava, and superior vena cava has the job of draining deoxygenated blood down to the right atrium, to the right atrium. So those blue vessels are veins, but look at this blue vessel. This blue vessel is not a vein because blood is gonna leave the right ventricle. It's going to be ejected or pumped through this pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk. And as blood is being ejected from the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk, that deoxygenated blood goes through the pulmonary arteries. Here's a left one. There's a right one over there. And they take the blood to the lungs. You then breathe in and out, freshly oxygenate the blood. That fresh oxygenated blood is gonna return via four pulmonary veins, two left ones here, and the two little red ones over there, those are the right pulmonary veins. And so that fresh oxygenated blood goes to the left atrium. So these veins are red because they're transporting oxygenated blood from the lungs to the left atrium. These arteries right here are blue because they're transporting deoxygenated blood from the left, from the right ventricle to the lungs. So the arteries and veins of the pulmonary circuit the colorations are reversed, as you're going to see when we look at pictures more so next week. So if you look at the real human heart over here, this is the right atrium up here. This little area right here is the tricuspid valve. The little strings that come off are the chordae tendineae, where those little strings insert into a little bitty muscle right there is called the papillary muscle. And then this whole thing is the right ventricle. Here is the pulmonary semilunar valve right there. So the blood goes from the right ventricle through that valve into the pulmonary trunk and then through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. The blood is then going to return back to the left atrium, which is not exposed here. The surface of the atrium is called an auricle. So the roof or the top of the atrium is called an auricle. So that's a left auricle of the left atrium right there. You then have that blood going from the left atrium down to the left ventricle right here, right? Now, internally in the heart, the, the chambers are separated from each other physically. So blood doesn't go from one chamber directly into another one. So the structures that internally separate the chambers from one another are called septa. Septum singular, septa with an A on the end would be plural. So this is called the interventricular septum right here. The word interventricular means literally between ventricles. 
So the septum that is between the ventricles is called the interventricular septum. And here it is, right? Now there is an interatrial septum, but it kind of lies behind this stuff, you know, behind the arteries right here. And it separates the atria from one another. The inter, what's called the interatrial septum. All right, let's go through the blood flow through the heart and then look at the coronary circuit. So if you look at this flow chart here, it shows one side's blue, one side's red. They show the lungs at the top. I think you guys can recognize the lungs. And then they show this weird structure at the bottom. So what we're looking at here at the top and the bottom of the flow chart are capillary beds. So this area at the bottom represents all of the capillary beds in the body in what we call the systemic circuit. So this would be capillary beds in your kidney, in your liver, in your intestine, in your stomach, in the glands of the body, whatever. These are the capillary beds and all the, the vascular tissues and organs out in the body somewhere. At the top, this represents the capillary beds in and around all of the alveoli or really in the lungs, the pulmonary capillaries. The reason why that's there is because it is at the capillary beds everywhere in the body where gas exchange occurs. Oxygen and CO2 is exchanged and nutrients for that matter. Although they, you know, they don't put nutrients on here, but gases are exchanged, nutrients and waste are exchanged all through capillary beds, right? So let's look at the capillary bed at the bottom. I always like to start at number 10 to describe the blood flow. And then I'll show you on the, on the picture of the heart. A capillary bed in our body really has a couple of anatomical parts to it, at least all of them except for one capillary bed, which is in your kidney. We'll, co we'll cover that later. But notice a capillary bed, part of it looks red, part of it's colored blue. So the part that's red has a little bitty artery called an arteriole that supplies the freshly oxygenated blood to the capillary bed of the tissue. So your fresh oxygenated blood is going to be coming in in what I like to call the arterial feed of the capillary bed. So the arterial end of the capillary bed, blood is flowing into it. Then you have a little blue part and then blood is going to leave the capillary bed via a small vein called a venule. So this is why the capillary bed changes colors. The fresh oxygenated blood comes in through the little artery. All of the tissue cells, which are not shown all around the capillaries, take out the oxygen they need. At the same time, they take all the CO2 waste gas product and put it into the blood. So by the time the blood goes through the capillary bed, some of the oxygen has been removed so the cells can use it and CO2 has been added to the blood. So that blood that leaves a capillary bed is called deoxygenated. This is fresh oxygenated blood coming in. This is deoxygenated blood leaving, all right? Now, all of those small veins that are collecting deoxygenated blood from all the capillary beds in the body, they begin to converge on one another to form larger and larger veins until they form the largest of the veins in the body. The largest veins in the body supply blood directly into the right atrium. So the right atrium only receives deoxygenated blood from three sources, the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus, which I'll show you a picture of that in a second. The superior vena cava, which is located right here on this picture, is draining deoxygenated blood from all of the tissues and structures that lie above the heart. So from your arms, your head, neck region, all that deoxygenated blood drains down to the right atrium via the superior vena cava. The inferior vena cava is draining deoxygenated blood from all of the structures and tissues and organs that lie below the heart. So from your legs, your abdomen, all your abdominal organs, your stomach, intestine, all of that, all that deoxygenated blood drains ultimately back up into the right atrium, 
from the inferior vena cava. And then deoxygenated blood from the heart muscle itself drains into the right atrium from what's called the coronary sinus. So all deoxygenated blood from the entire body, from below the heart, above the heart, and from the heart muscle itself, all returns back to the right atrium. Now, blood's going to move from the right atrium and go through the right AV valve, which is called the tricuspid valve, in order for that deoxygenated blood to get to the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, that deoxygenated blood is going to be ejected through the pulmonary semilunar valve and into the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries, which supply the deoxygenated blood to our lungs. And as that deoxygenated blood goes into your pulmonary capillaries, we breathe in and out, we load the blood with oxygen, and we remove the CO2, which we exhale out. And that freshly oxygenated blood then leaves the lungs via the pulmonary veins. The pulmonary veins then drain the oxygenated blood to the left atrium. From the left atrium, receiving only the oxygenated blood from the lungs, sends that oxygenated blood through the, the left AV valve, called the bicuspid valve, into the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, that oxygenated blood is going to be ejected out of the heart through the aortic semilunar valve and into the aorta and all of its arterial branches to go back out to the body to send oxygenated blood to all the body cells again. So this keeps happening every second of every day you're alive in order to keep all of the cells and organs and tissues in your body living. So let's look at the picture, the blood flow through the picture. So here's the right atrium receiving blood from its three sources superior and inferior vena cavas, coronary sinus, all that's deoxygenated blood. The blood's gonna go from the right atrium through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. The deoxygenated blood has to go through the pulmonary semilunar valve into the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk courses posteriorly and subdivides into a left and right pulmonary arteries. That sends the blood to the lungs. You breathe in and out. You oxygenate the blood. The oxygenated blood returns back to the left atrium via four pulmonary veins, two from the left lung and two from the right lung. And that oxygenated blood goes from the left atrium through the bicuspid or mitral valve, the left AV valve, to go down to the left ventricle. The left ventricle then has the job of ejecting blood through the aortic semilunar valve, right here, into the aorta. Specifically, it goes into the ascending aorta first, then through the arch of the aorta, and that's when we start seeing that fresh oxygenated blood being distributed through all the branches off the aorta and then down the descending aorta and off all of its branches we're gonna learn about next week. So that's the blood flow through the heart. You have to know the blood flow through the heart, all right? Then we have to know the coronary circuit, some of the major coronary arteries and veins. So technically, we call the blood supply to the heart itself its own circuit. We call it the coronary circuit. But technically, it's a subsection of what we call the systemic circuit. But nonetheless, it's gonna work this way. Again, arteries are gonna carry the, the freshly oxygenated blood to the heart itself. So all of those arteries are red. Those vessels are red. All of the blue vessels that you see on this side are going to collect all of the deoxygenated used up blood, so to speak, from the cardiac muscle and ultimately drain it to the posterior part of the heart through all of these larger veins on the heart. The largest vein lies on the back of the heart. It's called the coronary sinus. So that's the largest of the veins. It's a special vein called a sinus. And I don't know if you could tell, 
but the artist really drew this picture where it's kind of translucent. So back here is the posterior side of the heart. So it lies on the back. All right. So that's the back of the heart. So I, I want you to know really the four main names of the arteries, coronary arteries. So there are two principal coronary arteries that have two main branches each. We have a right coronary artery right here, the RCA, and we have a left coronary artery, the LCA. The coronary arteries, the right one and the left one, are the only arterial branches that come off of the ascending aorta. So that ensures that the heart receives fresh oxygenated blood before any other tissue in the body. Because let's go back to this picture. Look where the blood's coming from. The fresh oxygenated blood comes from the left ventricle, goes up into the ascending aorta. So before it hits any other branch to go to a part of the body, fresh oxygenated blood is gonna go to the heart itself. So the right coronary artery has two branches. There's a main branch that goes down the right lateral side of the heart. It's called the marginal branch. So it supplies fresh oxygenated blood to the right side of the heart. Then there's a branch that courses posterior, goes back here, and goes down a little groove in the heart. The grooves on the heart are called the salsi. You can't see it on this picture, but they're called the sulcus, singular. So the sulcus on the back of the heart is called the posterior interventricular sulcus. And the artery back there that courses through that sulcus is called the posterior interventricular branch of the right coronary artery. So the right artery divides into the marginal branch and the posterior interventricular branch right here. The left coronary artery also has two main branches. And of course, notice, off of these branches, you have all these little bitty branches everywhere. We're not worrying about all of those. We're just learning the, the, the four main names, all right? So the left coronary artery courses into, and it, it branches right here, but the main branch that goes down the anterior side of the heart would course through a sulcus on the anterior side of the heart. And that sulcus, on the anterior side of the heart is called the anterior interventricular sulcus. The artery that goes down that sulcus is called the anterior interventricular branch of the left coronary artery. So that is the also called, this branch also has a common name. It's also called the LAD. Some of y'all might even notice already if you work in the heart lab, the cath lab, they might say the LAD. It's called the LAD, the left anterior descending artery. The name defines exactly what and where it is. Hear the name real quick. Left anterior descending artery. That's because it comes from the left coronary artery. It's on the anterior side of the heart and it descends down the heart. Left anterior descending, the LAD. This is also the artery that they call the widow maker uh, because this is like one of the main arteries that supplies oxygenated blood to both right and left parts of the heart on the anterior side. You get a major blockage in there, you have a, someone can have a major heart attack, all right? Well, it can happen with any of the arteries, but this is just commonly called the widow maker. So where the left, uh, where the left coronary artery subdivides right here, this side is the LAD or the, or the anterior interventricular artery. And then where it branches over here goes down the left lateral side of the heart right there, that's called the circumflex branch. Right now, all of the veins that are on the heart also course along a similar path with their main artery. Now, we're going to learn three vein names the vein on the anterior side of the heart that courses in the same sulcus with the LAD is called the great cardiac vein. 
So it's going to drain all the deoxygenated blood from the anterior side of the heart back over to the coronary sinus. Then there's a, a vein that runs in the posterior sulcus back here with the posterior interventricular artery right there. This vein is called the middle cardiac vein. And then the largest of the veins that you're going to identify is a coronary sinus, just a big blue vein on the back of the heart. All right, can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yes. Very good. Yes. All right, so you're going to be able to go back and review this video. I know you're not catching all the names unless you've already gone through it many times already. It's, it, you're not going to remember every single name that I throw out, but it's imperative that you go back and you review the video and you review the pictures in your learning resources in your modules. All right. So the next little area that we have to talk about is something called the conduction system. So you're going to be learning the parts of what's called the intrinsic conduction system of the heart. And this is, the, the conduction system is composed of special types of cardiac cells that during development of the fetus in utero, while the baby's developing in the womb of the mother, some of the cardiac muscle cells lose the ability to contract. They'll never contract again but they maintain the ability to spontaneously generate electrical impulses. So we learned a little bit about that in the nervous system in AMP1, right? Neurons generate electrical impulses. We call them action potentials. So the heart itself can generate its own electrical potentials from what we call the conduction system. For that reason, the heart is autorhythmic. It generates spontaneously and in a very rhythmic fashion its own electrical signals that gives us our heartbeat, our, our sinus rhythm of our, of our cardiac cycle, all right? So I'll just say this. If you, if you sever every single nerve that went to the heart, every nerve that goes to the heart, if you severed it, the heart would still beat in your chest. In fact, that's exactly what happens when they do a heart transplant. They have to cut everything to take the heart out and put the new heart in. So if you severed every nerve that went to the heart, your resting heart rate would be about 100 beats per minute because everybody's heard of the pacemaker before. The pacemaker are a group of these special cells of the conduction system that actually generate impulses at about 100 times per minute right? So we have to know about the conduction system so we can go through what an EKG is in a second. So let's look at the picture for a minute. The picture shows us where the different parts of the conduction system are located. So as it turns out, the pacemaker, what's called the pacemaker, is called the pacemaker because it sends out electrical impulses faster than the rest of the parts of the conduction system. It basically sets the pace. Although each part of the conduction system can generate electrical impulses on their own. So the pacemaker just does it the fastest. So the pacemaker is called the sinoatrial node. That's what this is, or SA node. The SA node is located in the posterior wall of the right atrium. So here's the right atrium. It's gonna generate electrical impulses very quickly and those electrical impulses then traverse the muscle mass of the atria. So the what's called the atrial muscle swirl up here. And then the atria become depolarized and then they contract. The electrical impulses then reach the next part of the conduction system, which is called the atrioventricular node or the AV node. The AV node has a job of collecting electrical impulses from the atria and sending the electrical impulses down what's called the atrioventricular bundle. This little bundle right here is called the AV bundle. The older name is called the bundle of his. 
So this bundle, by the way, is very important. This AV bundle is the only place where electrical impulses can go from the atria down to the lower ventricles. So um, some of y'all might have heard of a heart block before. There's different degrees of heart block. A heart block is where the electrical impulses that are trying to go from the atria, basically from the AV node down the AV bundle, is slowed down for some reason or missing. A complete heart block is where no electrical impulses go down the AV bundle. That's the most severe heart block, a third degree heart block. Or the heart block can be where the, the electrical impulses are just slowed down. And that can be seen on an EKG on somebody because the number of times that their ventricles contract in a minute would be slower than normal because they are receiving electrical impulses more slowly. However, some of you might have heard of uh, people, you might even know somebody, that have been diagnosed with SVTs, supraventricular tachycardia. Supraventricular tachycardia is where electrical impulses are arising up, ari uh, arising up here in the upper atria and going down the AV node too quickly, down to a ventricle. So there's different types of cardiac arrhythmias that can happen when electrical impulses are not passed down the AV bundle correctly, all right? But for now, let's just learn what it does normally. It collects the electrical impulses from the AV node, sends them down to what are called the bundle branches. So notice in the interventricular septum, which separates the right ventricle from the left ventricle, the AV bundle subdivides into what we call a right bundle branch and a left bundle branch. Both of these bundle branches course down to the apex of the heart. And as they reach the apex of the heart, they curve upward to go all throughout the, the ventricular myocardium. The myocardium is the muscle. So it goes throughout the muscle tissue of the ventricle. That's what the ventricular myocardium means. So the right bundle branch then courses over and it turns into what we call Purkinje fibers. Those are thick fibers that just radiate throughout the muscle tissue of the ventricle, the ventricular myocardium. So you have uh, Purkinje fibers on the right side of the heart. You have Purkinje fibers on the left side of the heart as well. So it is the generation and propagation of these electrical impulses that allow the heart to work the way it does. And we're gonna go over a, a brief part of the cardiac cycle in a minute. So does anybody have any questions before I move to the next slide about the conduction system? No. What you said about generation and propagation that last sentence, please. Okay. The electrical impulses have to be generated. Right. So. All of the other tissues in your body, like muscle, your skeletal muscle tissue, you, you have to generate nerve impulses in your brain that go down neurons and nerves that go to your muscle in order to get your muscle to contract. Our heart is different. Like I said, you can sever all those nerves and the heart's still going to work on its own. The reason for that is because the pacemakers, which the primary pacemaker is the SA node, it automatically and rhythmically generates electrical impulses. Those electrical impulses then are transferred from one cell to the next throughout the atrial muscle mass up here, which is not shown. It's all collected by the AV node. The AV node then sends that electrical impulse down through the rest of the conduction system. And as the electrical impulses move, through either, either through the muscle cells or down through the, the conduction fibers, that's called conducting. So the electrical impulses have to be generated and then conducted or propagated. Propagate is the other word for that. All right. Now, the reason why I said there's, you know, this is the primary um, pacemaker is because I'm sure you heard 
patients that are candidates to have pacemakers put in. I'm sure everybody's heard of that, right? Something like that. The reason for that is because sometimes our pacemaker goes out. The SA node stops working the way it's supposed to. And so what happens then in those individuals before they go get a pacemaker put in or some sort of an assisted cardiac assisted device put in, they rely on the AV node. So if the, if the SA node stops working, then the heart doesn't just stop because the AV node takes over the job of being the pacemaker. So the AV node though, generates electrical impulses more slowly than the SA node. So like I said, the SA node sends out impulses at about 100 times a minute. The AV node is around 50 times a minute. What if the AV node went out? Well, then we rely on an AV bundle because each part of this system can spontaneously generate electrical impulses. But if there's already an impulse coming down that part of the system, they don't generate their own. So the further from the pacemaker, we, the normal pacemaker we get, the slower impulse generation becomes. For instance, these bundle branches right here only generate on their own about 20 electrical impulses a minute. So if the rest of this system stopped working and the ventricles had to rely on the electrical impulses generated by the, the bundle branches, then you wouldn't live very long because we cannot live if our ventricles only beat 20 times a minute. We don't live very long. It doesn't, it's not sufficient enough to support life. So those individuals have to go get ventricular assisted devices put in. There's also, uh, you know, pacemakers they can get put in, all sorts of things. So that's what I'm, that's what we're talking about. The generation and conduction or propagation of electrical impulses. All right, so let's look at what types of ions are moving across the membranes of the cells to generate the electrical impulses. And that's what you're looking at on the graph right here. So this is somewhat of a review from AMP1 when we covered um, depolarization and repolarization and all of that, I think was introduced to you in chapter 10 and 12 of the book. So I wanna re-go over this a little bit. So what you're looking at on this graph, the green areas represent when the inside of the cell becomes positively charged, which is called depolarization. So I don't know if you remember, and I don't have a picture to show you right now, but the plasma membrane of the cells in the body separate the extracellular fluid from the intracellular fluid. I'm sure you guys remember that. And as it turns out, the extracellular fluid on the outside of our cells have an abundance of positive charges in it. And the main positive charge in extracellular fluid is sodium. Whole bunch of sodium out there. Relative to the number of positive charges on the inside of the cell, just on the inside of the membrane, are much fewer. So since there's more positive charges on the outside of the cell than on the in, just on the inside of the membrane, and thus there's more negative charges just on the inside of the membrane, typically in the form of phosphates on proteins, then the inside of the cell would be negative relative to the outside of the cell. So if we were to stick electrodes on the surface of the cell, monitoring the, the extracellular fluid and one poking into the cell, monitoring the intracellular fluid and no ions move across the membrane whatsoever. Not, all ion channels are closed and no ions move at all. We would record and measure and record a straight line at some negative number. So in the case of a cardiac muscle cell, that negative number is around a minus 90. The minus sign represents the fact that the inside of the cell is negative relative, relative to the outside of the cell. So if no charges move at all across the membrane, you would just record a straight line at that negative value. And that negative value is called the resting 
membrane potential, the RMP, resting membrane potential. Now, let's say though, that I open a sodium channel. Who remembers which direction sodium will always move in down its gradient if we open a sodium channel at the cell surface? Which direction will it move in, in or out of the cell? Inside the cell. In. Very good, whoever said that, because I can't see y'all's names. Sodium always moves in. And this is physiology 101, people. You need to remember this. It, it, this stuff is important all the time and in later chapters. The direction in which sodium will always move if you open a sodium channel will be from the extracellular fluid across the membrane to the inside of the cell. Now, who remembers what charge sodium is? Positive. It's positive. So look what happens if I open a whole bunch of sodium channels at one time. I all of a sudden gain a whole bunch of positive charges just to the inside of the cell. Look what would happen to your number line. Yep, I gained a whole bunch of positive charges and sure enough, that membrane potential that used to be negative is now positive. So when the membrane potential of an electrically excitable cell like a neuron or a muscle cell becomes more positive, that's always called depolarization. Depolarization is always excitatory. So muscle cells have to be depolarized before they can contract. That's the key here. So in cardiac muscle physiology, the depolarization is a little bit more complex than in skeletal muscle that we learned in AMP1. In AMP1, the graph would look like this we would have a rapid depolarization where the line goes up, but then we would have a red line all of a sudden that comes right back down and it makes more like a pyramid. So you would depolarize, contract, and repolarize and relax in skeletal muscle. In cardiac muscle though, it looks different. We have what's called rapid depolarization. That means we depolarize very quickly and it's due to the influx of sodium, positively charged. And you need to know that. What causes rapid depolarization? Oh, the influx of sodium. Now, all of a sudden, the sodium channels open very quickly and then they close very quickly, right here. So sodium stops coming into the cell. However, just because we close the sodium channels does not mean that the membrane potential becomes negative again right away. It stays positive because at what's called the plateau phase, we don't gain sodium anymore, but we gain calcium. Now, calcium is positively charged. If you open a cell surface calcium channel, calcium will always move to the inside of the cell as well. So those calcium channels are called slow gated, voltage gated, slow calcium channels. They're called slow because they're slow to open and they're slow to close, right? That's all. And all of these channels are voltage gated, by the way. Voltage gated means that a change in the membrane potential is what opens the gate. Voltage gated. So voltage-gated calcium channels open, calcium flows to the inside of the cell and maintains that depolarized state, which is called the plateau phase. So the plateau phase is the phase at which the ventricles are completely depolarized. I'll show you that on a cardiac cycle in a minute, on, a, on the EKG in a minute. But the importance of this plateau phase is this. Look down here at the bottom. There's something called the refractory period. A refractory period is a time frame, some amount of time. And it's some amount of time at which, in this case, muscle tissue cannot contract again. It's called the refractory period. So look at the refractory period for our cardiac muscle is about 
300 milliseconds, all right? Um, the absolute refractory period is a little bit less than that, but about 300 milliseconds, refractory period. 300 milliseconds, by the way, is 0.3 seconds right here, all right? Now, if I looked at the refractory period in skeletal muscle, which I'm not gonna do for this test, but I'm just using this as an example. The refractory period in skeletal muscle is only about five to 15 milliseconds. That's a lot quicker than 300 milliseconds. So why am I telling you this? Well, the shorter the refractory period enables a muscle cell to contract before it has relaxed. And when that happens, if the muscle cell contracts before it relaxes, you basically, it's called a charley horse. If, if we consider our skeletal muscles, in which case the muscle contracts and it locks up. Well, we don't want that to happen to our heart because if your heart contracts and it doesn't relax, it can't refill with blood to pump blood out on the next beat. So this is why the plateau phase is so important. It ensures that we have a longer refractory period, all right? Then look what happens at the end of the refractory, I mean, at the end of the plateau phase. The calcium channels close, but voltage-gated potassium channels open. Now, if you open a potassium channel, potassium will always leave the cell and potassium is positively charged. So if I open potassium channels, potassium is gonna leave the cell, in which case the inside of the cell becomes negative again. And I see that the membrane potential regains this negative value. That's called repolarization. So repolarization has to happen in order for the muscle to relax. And so we go through a contraction phase and a relaxation phase, a contraction phase and a relaxation phase for the cardiac cycle, which is all induced by what we call the electrical cycle. So this is what you're looking at, the electrical cycle of the heart. We have rapid depolarization due to the influx of sodium. We have the plateau phase of depolarization due to the influx of calcium. And that all causes contraction of the chambers. And then we have the repolarization phase of the electrical cycle. And thereafter, the heart is going to relax. The chambers are going to relax, All right? So let's look at the EKG. The EKG is a tracing of the electrical activity of the heart. So if we hook up somebody to the leads, and I'm sure you've seen that in the hospital, you got you know, all these wires hooked up to them, and it, those wires go to a, a monitor, and you can see on the monitor, uh, you know, the cardiac monitor goes blip, 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 blip. Everybody knows that, right? That shows the heartbeat. Well, the blip, blip on the heartbeat looks like this, technically, on what we call a type 2 lead. So what you're looking at here are millivolt deviations from a baseline. Some of, and these are called waves or deflections as it goes up or they go down, up and down, all of that. So on the EKG, we can identify particular waves and you're gonna have to be able to identify the wave and you're gonna have to know a little bit about what the wave represents, which I'm about to tell you. And it's also found in our learning resource material. So, let me start at the first wave. This is the beginning. Oh, first of all, let me look at, look at the time frame. This, this tracing represents what happens in one heartbeat, one cardiac cycle. So when somebody is just at rest, that means they're not running on a treadmill. They're not physically active. They're not exerting energy, but they're just resting. They're on average, on a healthy individual, one of their heartbeats or cardiac cycles last 800 milliseconds. This is less than one second. So 0.8 seconds is about one heartbeat, all right? Now, what you're looking at with, these, with the waves and deflections here, 
occur because of the conduction system of the heart, which we just went over, the pacemaker and all of that, and the electrical cycle of the heart that we just covered. So let's look at these waves. I'm going to first identify them, then tell you a little bit about each one. So the waves from beginning to end go in this order. The P wave, that's what we call that. And then there's a series of three waves. The Q, R, S, complex. Or we could say the Q wave, the R wave, and the S wave. And then we have the T wave. Now, on some EKGs, there's also a little U wave. I'm not going to get into that. With certain blips before the T wave, there's something called a U wave. I'm not getting into the abnormalities and whatnot. You have to take your EKG class for that. I will mention a couple of abnormalities that happen, but we're not going to identify them. So let me tell you, oh, the other thing that's important about the EKG are these time intervals. There are time intervals on here that represent aspects of the cardiac cycle. So I'm going to mention uh, some of those in a second. So let's see what happens here. If I put electrical leads on somebody in order to monitor their heartbeat, I would see this. As soon as the SA node fires, let's, let's go to this picture. The SA node fires, boom, and sends out ele electrical impulses. I would automatically record the P wave. Excuse me, so the P wave is recorded as soon as the SA node fires. Now, the rest of the deviations that we see, the waves, and the rest of the time are the electrical impulses as it courses through the rest of the conduction system, which is attributed to depolar depolarizing events and repolarizing events on the EKG. So let's look at them. So the SA node fires, boom, I record P wave. But the P wave represents the fact not only that the person's SA node is working, because as soon as you see this, you know their SA node works. But it also represents the fact that the atria were depolarized and then contracted. So that's what the P wave represents. H, it, it represents the fact that the SA node works, it fired. But it also represents the fact that the atria become depolarized and then they contract. And that's important. And I'll tell you why that is in a second. And then you get to the QRS complex. So the QRS complex is representing the beginning of the depolarizing phase of a ventricle, of the ventricles. So this represents when the ventricles are beginning to become depolarized. And then we have the ST segment. The ST segment right here on the EKG represents this plateau phase. So the ST segment is the plateau phase, which is the depolarization of the ventricles, the complete depolarization of the ventricles. So we have rapid depolarization of the ventricles, and then the completion of depolarization is the plateau phase. And then the, the, the ventricles are contracting during this time period, which is through the ST segment. So the ventricles start to contract just after the QRS complex hits, they're completely contracted into the ST segment and just into what's called the T wave. The T wave represents the repolarization of the ventricles. And so the repolarization of the ventricles is where the ventricles, the cells in the ventricles are gonna open their potassium channels. We lose potassium and we repolarize. So this T wave represents ventricular repolarization. The QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization. The ST segment represents the plateau, the plateau phase of ventricular depolarization, where they're completely contracting. The T wave represents ventricular repolarization, and then the subsequent, from this point forward, until 
the next QRS complex, what happened over here, the ventricles are in relaxation phase. They're relaxing. So we have a wave that represents atrial depolarization and subsequent contraction. We have waves that represent QRS complex that represents ventricular depolarization and the subsequent contraction phases. And then we have the T wave, which represents ventricular repolarization. So somebody tell me what wave on this EKG represents atrial repolarization or does, or do the atria even repolarize? What do you think if you had to guess? Is it the P wave? No, the P wave represents atrial depolarization. Uh, yeah. I don't think that the atria repolarizes. The atria do repolarize. All, I'm glad you said Is that. it the R wave? No, you're no. close though. Technically this QRS complex is only for the ventricle, but I'll tell you this. The ventricles are, the, the muscle tissue of the ventricles is so much more massive than the, than the muscle tissue of the atrial wall that when the ventricles begin to depolarize, demonstrated by the downward deflection of the Q wave, that it overrides any wave that represents atrial repolarization. So the atrial repolarizing wave is actually buried by the Q wave. And some books even describe it as the Q wave also represents uh, atrial repolarization, but I don't want y'all to say that. Because on the test, I'll ask you, which of the waves represent ventricular depolarization? And it'll say P wave, QRS, or T wave, something like that. So if that is a question, you're gonna have to put the QRS complex because the QRS complex represents when the ventricles are depolarizing. Is everybody with me? Yeah. Yes. All right, very good. Now, um, one of the time intervals I wanted to mention briefly before we move forward to get into the last bit of physiology we have to uh, start getting into for today, because I know your brains are tired. We've been in here an hour and a half, um, is the PQ interval. And in some books, it's, uh, and even on, you know, in the hospital, they, they refer to this as the PR interval. The only reason for that is because it's easier to measure the difference between the beginning of the P wave and the very top of the R wave than it is to get to this little crevice. But technically, the PQ interval is the time period during which the electrical impulse traverses the entire conduction system of the heart. And look how long of a time period it is. It's only 0.2 seconds, 200 milliseconds. So in 200 milliseconds, this would happen. The SA node would fire. Electrical impulses go throughout the atrial myocardium. The atria depolarize because of the P wave. They then contract the Electrical impulses go to the AV node, then down through the AV bundle, through the bundle branches towards the apex, through the Purkinje fibers, when the ventricles then become depolarized. So when the ventricular myocardium becomes depolarized or begins to become depolarized, is that this downward deflection called Q. So it takes 200 milliseconds, which is faster then I can snap my finger for the electrical impulse to be generated by the SA node and to traverse the entire conduction system. It's pretty quick, right? All right, so that's the EKG. Just know how to identify the waves and what the waves represent. I do have that in some learning resources in the module. So if you have some trouble with that, all you have to do is just, just email me. All right, the last thing that we have to talk about is getting into the cardiac output and what cardiac output is, all right, and the parameters that regulate cardiac output. So cardiac output is a diagnostic measurement 
of the effectiveness of cardiac activity in your patient. I'll say it again. It's a diagnostic measurement of how efficient your patient's heart is, is performing. So what exactly is that cardiac output? Well, not only does it represent how well somebody's heart's working, but what it directly is, is the volume of blood that the ventricles eject out of the heart into their arteries every minute. So how much blood volume the ventricles eject into the cardiovascular system every minute is called cardiac output. Hold on one second, let me take a drink of my water. My throat gets a little dry talking this long. All right, so cardiac output can be calculated using the values of two parameters. There's two basic parameters that affect how much blood your heart pumps out every minute or the volume of blood that the ventricles eject into their arteries every minute. And those two parameters are heart rate. Everybody knows heart rate. How many times a minute your heart beats, beats per minute, all right? And then we have something called stroke volume. And stroke volume is the volume of blood that is ejected from the ventricles on each beat of the heart or each stroke of the heart. So if you wanted to know the volume of blood that is ejected from the ventricles every minute, you basically have to know two things. You have to know how much blood is ejected on each beat, and you're gonna multiply that by how many times a minute your heart beats. It's that simple. So volume per minute, milliliters per minute, is the unit for cardiac output. Not too bad, huh? I know it gets a little bit more complicated because we have to look at some of the parameters that affect these parameters. All right, so that's cardiac output. You need to know this formula. Cardiac output is blood volume per minute. So it's measured in milliliters per minute. It changes based on the stroke volume and the heart rate. So for instance, Everybody knows that if you go to the gym and you start running on a treadmill, your heart rate goes up. Everybody knows that. One reason why, and your stroke volume also goes up, but we just don't know why or how yet. But when your heart rate goes up, the reason why that does that, it's important because if you're working your muscles out, they need more blood flow. They need more oxygen to make ATP aerobically. They need more nutrients, sugar, to make ATP, right? So we have to send more blood there. How do we send more blood to a tissue? You increase the volume of blood that the heart pumps out every minute, which is cardiac output. So we can increase how much blood we pump out on each beat, and we can increase how many times a minute our heart beats. So I put in this little PowerPoint and uh, animation. You guys can go and, and view that uh, after you know we're done. Uh, sometime later, you have to be connected to the internet to play it. So this is just an animation that actually is in some, some of the other learning resources, some for lecture, some for the lab, but mainly this came from the lecture, all right? So you, you can view that. So um, just to finish up with cardiac output, we're going to go through the parameters that affect cardiac output briefly. So the two parameters that affect cardiac output is stroke volume and heart rate. There are three principal factors that affect stroke volume. There's something called the preload, something called contractility, and there's something called the afterload. Oh, you know what I should do? Before I do that, because I don't see it on here, I think I did that on the board last time is why. Let me see if I can click on this. Stroke volume, we have to know what that is. Stroke volume also equals something called, and let me 
lower my font size. How do you do that? Oh, here it is. It's the font, I guess. Equals the end diastolic volume, which is the EDV, minus the end systolic volume, or the ESB. So the stroke volume equals the EDV, whoops, oh, messed up. EDV, well, why am I writing that? I'll just put it here. The end diastolic volume, which is the EDV minus the end systolic volume, which is the ESB. So I need to tell you what this means in order to describe how it affects stroke volume, all right? So to do that, I need to go back, and you guys can just uh, write this down because it's not in the PowerPoint. I had to just type that in. Stroke volume equals the EDV minus the ESV. That's what we're learning. So let me go back to the heart picture. Everybody look at the picture of this heart. I went through the blood flow through the heart. So um, earlier I called the ventricles pumping chambers and I called the atria receiving chambers. So the atria and the ventricles both receive and pump blood by the way, but we typically call them that because the atria is gonna receive blood and send the blood to the ventricle. The ventricles have to receive blood from the atria only. Now the ventricles are the pumps of the heart because they are the chambers that will eject blood out into the system, either the pulmonary circuit or the systemic circuit. The right ventricle, by the way, which I, I think I failed to mention, is pretty much considered to be the pulmonary pump because it pumps blood to the lungs and back to the heart. The left ventricle is called the systemic pump because it pumps blood out to the body through the aorta and then ultimately back to the right atrium via the veins. So this is called the systemic pump. But I want everybody to look at this. How, how much blood do each of these ventricles eject into their respective artery when they contract on their beat? How much blood do they pump out on that one beat? The stroke volume, that's how much blood volume. So every time the ventricle, and they, they contract at the same time, by the way, we alternate between contraction and relaxation between the atria and the ventricles. We're going to learn more about that in lecture, but nonetheless, how much blood each one of the, the volume of blood, each one of these ventricles ejects into their respective artery is called the stroke volume. And on average at rest, it's about 125 to 130 mils or so. You don't have to memorize that number, by the way. I'm gonna supply some easy numbers for you, but you just have to know what the, the formula is. So how can we increase how much volume can be ejected out of this ventricle in this one? Well, one of the parameters of stroke volume tells us that. So I wanna use this diagram. Hopefully you can envision this. So how much blood the ventricles can pump out is dependent upon how much blood was loaded into the ventricle from the atrium. So if the atrium only delivered a little bit of blood in here before the ventricle contracts, only a little bit of blood would be ejected out. If the atrium dumped in a whole lot of blood into the ventricle before the ventricle contracts, then more blood will be ejected out. Common sense, right? Well, the other thing you have to know is this as well. When the ventricles begin to contract, when they begin to contract, you cannot put any more blood into them. So the ventricles can only fill up with blood when they're relaxing. The second they begin to contract, they have all of the blood volume in there that can be ejected out is the point. So let me go back 
to the words. Look at these words, end diastolic volume and the end systolic volume. The word diastole, by the way, means relaxation. If you know your blood pressure numbers, you know how you, in blood pressure you have a, a top number and a bottom number, right? The top number on your blood pressure number values is called the systolic value. The bottom number of your blood pressure is called the diastolic value. So why is that? Well, because the top number is the pressure number that's generated. That pressure is generated while the ventricles are contracting or they're in systole. The word systole means contraction. The bottom number of your blood pressure or your diastolic value is the pressure in the artery while the ventricles are relaxed. And that word that means relaxation is diastole. So look at these words for a second. The end diastolic volume is a word that describes exactly what it is. It is the volume of blood that is in the ventricle at the end of ventricular diastole. So when the ventricles are finished relaxing, how much blood do you have in the ventricle means something. It's the EDV. If the EDV is higher, you're going to eject more blood out of the ventricle on that beat. If the EDV is lower, you're going to eject less blood out of the ventricle on that beat. Now the EDV can go up and down depending on what your body is doing. So if you're just sitting down right now or when you're lying down, your EDV is lower than when you're running on a treadmill. And I'm gonna explain why in a second. Now, what about the, the ESV? Well, the name defines exactly what it is. It's the volume of blood that is in the ventricle at the end of ventricular systole. Yep, at the end of ventricular contraction, there is always a little bit of blood left in the ventricle. So let me go back up here and show you the picture again. When these ventricles contract, they don't eject every single drop of blood out into their artery. It depends on what you're doing and how, how forceful the contraction force is of the ventricle. So when the ventricles go to contract, if they contract a little bit, they'll eject some blood out, but some will stay behind. The amount of blood that is left in a ventricle after the ventricle has contracted is called the ESV. So in order to calculate how much blood your ventricle pumps out on one beat, which is called the stroke volume, milliliters per beat, you have to know two things. You have to know how much blood you start, how much blood volume you start with and how much blood volume you end with at the end of the ventricular part of the cycle. So if I start with X amount of volume and I end with X amount of volume, all I do is sub subtract from what I started with, what I end with, and I have how much was ejected out. To put it to you an easier way, in order for you to know how much money you spend, you have to know how much you start with and how much you have left. The difference is what you spent. So if you start with $100, but you, you're left with 50, then you spent $50 somewhere. It's the same thing here. The words are just a little bit more complex, that's all. So how much blood do I start with, the EDV, minus how much blood do I end with left in the ventricle? after the ventricle contracts, the ESV. So the stroke volume is dependent upon these things. So that's what we're getting into. So look at the parameters here now that we know what the EDV and the ESV is or are. The first two parameters are the most important right here, physiologically. So I'm gonna tell you what a preload is. The preload on the wall of a ventricle 
is the degree to which the ventricular wall is stretched. How stretched is it? Is it stretched a lot or is it stretched just a little bit? The more stretch that is put on the wall of a ventricle, the harder the ventricle contracts. And the harder the ventricle contracts, the more blood that it will eject out. In which case, your stroke volume would increase. So this is like a rubber band. I always describe this like a rubber band. If I, if I told you all to get a rubber band and stretch it one inch and then let go of it, of course, you know it's gonna snap back, right? It's gonna snap back with some force. But now I tell you, take the same rubber band and stretch it as far as you can and let go of it. It's gonna snap back with a lot more power. That's very similar to how our, our ventricular myocardium works. If we can stretch the wall of the ventricle by increasing the EDV, if we can put more blood in the ventricle just before it contracts, then the wall of the ventricle would be more stretched. Just like with a water balloon, you could put a little bit of water in it, or you could put a lot of water in it. If you put a lot of water in it, the balloon stretches even more, it's common sense. So the preload is the degree to which the ventricular wall is stretched, is directly attributed to the EDV. So if we can increase the EDV, we increase the preload. And if we increase the preload, we increase the force of contraction, and thus we increase stroke volume. And if you increase the stroke volume, you increase the cardiac output. Because look at a simple equation. If this value goes up, the whole value, go, the whole equation goes up, right? If you put real numbers in here, if this was one times one, you would get one. But what if the stroke volume was two? Two times one is bigger than one times one. Everybody knows that. So if this value goes up or this value goes up, cardiac output is gonna go up. So in order to make cardiac output go up, we can make the stroke volume go up by, make, by increasing the preload. And you increase the preload by increasing the EDV. If you increase the EDV, you increase the stretch on the heart, which is the preload, and you increase the force of contraction. So I'm gonna tell you a couple of ways you can increase the EDV. One way is through increasing how much blood returns back to the heart from the body. It's called venous return. And if you increase the volume of blood that's returning back to the heart quicker, more blood volume will get into the ventricle before they go to contract. So this is an inherent process when you go to work out. When you start running on a treadmill, your heart rate goes up, your stroke volume is gonna go up and your cardiac output is gonna go up. It's gonna go up inherently because when you start contracting your muscles, your muscles squeeze on the veins in the body, which squishes the blood through the vein back to the heart faster. And if the blood gets back to the heart faster, you're going to put more blood in the ventricle, which is an increase in the EDV, which increases the preload, which increases the stroke volume, and increases the cardiac output. So that's one way that happens automatically in our body. I'll tell you another way that happens clinically. If you get a patient that's dehydrated, Severe, moderately to severely dehydrated, their blood pressure is low. We're gonna learn that through the semester. But what makes their blood pressure low? Well, because they don't have enough blood volume, because they're dehydrated. So what's the first thing you do as a clinician? You hang an IV bag on them, replace their fluid and electrolytes. All that fluid gets back into the blood vessel, which expands their blood volume. And guess where all that extra blood volume is gonna end up? in the ventricle, which increases the EDV to increase the preload, 
which increases the force of contraction, which increases stroke volume and increases cardiac output. That's, this concept is exactly why you hang an IV bag on a patient that's dehydrated, because you want to increase their cardiac output, to increase their blood pressure, so your patient won't die, right? All right, now, so that's the preload. Contractility is the forcefulness of contraction. There are certain uh, chemicals and agents that can increase the force of contraction. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are one of them, a couple of them, adrenaline and noradrenaline. So when we get our adrenaline rush, not only are we increasing heart rate with that, but you're also increasing the force of contraction. Now, the harder we contract, the more blood that your ventricles pump out. So your stroke volume goes up and cardiac output goes up. The afterload is something that we cannot change physiologically. The afterload is a pressure that must be overcome before the ventricles can eject blood into their artery. And it basically is the bottom number of your blood pressure. So if someone has high blood pressure and, is, and their bottom number is higher than normal, their ventricles have to work harder than normal before ejection can occur, in which case, this is the bad one. If you have a higher afterload, your cardiac output goes down. And so how does a person's body correct for that? They have a higher heart rate than normal, right? All right, so the last thing that I have to, to go over before we look at the parameters uh, for cardiac output in the flow chart is just this. What you see in blue are sensory inputs and motor outputs. All of this is also going to be looked at when we do the blood vessels next week. But I want you to go through the sensory inputs and the motor outputs and know a little bit about what happens. So where does it go? Well, it goes to a control center. This control center for the cardiovascular system is called the CV center, cardiovascular center. It's located in the medulla oblongata of the brainstem. So our brain is constantly, constantly receiving information about our blood pressure, about the chemistry changes of our blood and all of that. And depending on what type of conditions we're under, if our blood pressure is low, then the, cardi the cardiac center will send out sympathetic autonomic impulses to the heart and increase our heart rate and stroke volume to increase your blood pressure. If our blood pressure are too low, I mean, too, uh, yeah, if our blood pressure is too low, we get sympathetic output to increase pressure. If our pressure is too high, our CV center sends out parasympathetic output of the autonomic nervous system to the heart and it slows your heart rate down and your cardiac output goes down and your blood pressure goes down, all right? So just go through these inputs and the outputs that you see here. Same thing with this flow chart. I'm gonna let you guys look at it. I know your brains are dead. Just follow the chart as you see it here. Everything that you really need is on this chart to understand how we increase cardiac output. And obviously, they show two people phys being physically active here. When we're physically active, we increase preload to increase stroke volume, increase cardiac output. So just follow your flow chart and understand what goes on with that. That's going to help you with lecture as well. All right. All right. So let me stop sharing this screen. Whoops.